Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Updates on MAPE's Self-Leveling Underlayments. We have some brief housekeeping before we start. Your phones are on mute. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box in the corner of your screen, and we'll answer them at the end of today's session, if there's time, or via an email after. And of course, you can always send questions to MAPE Digital at mape.com. And we also invite you to visit the Floor Covering and Installation Systems page on our website, www.mape.com, where we have videos, projects, downloads, more. And it's all about adhesives and SLUs, all of which happens to be overseen by today's speaker, the business manager for MAPE's Floor Covering and Installation Systems product line, Jeff Johnson. Jeff brings to the industry more than 35 years experience in the development and marketing of floor covering installation products. His practical experience in the construction industry and as a bench chemist give him an insightful perspective on surface preparation, moisture mitigation, and floor covering installation. Today, he's gonna to provide us with an update about MAPE's self-leveling technology and I know that I'm gonna be taking a lot of notes. <laughs> so without further delay, Jeff, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jen, and welcome everyone. Thank you for spending a little bit of time with us as we learn a little bit about what we are doing in terms of updating some of our self-leveling other limits and some other position changes here within the pay on some information that I think you'll find interesting. Uh, you may ask or start questioning this presentation by how can you have updates on something that we've already got out in the marketplace for many, many years with a lot of good success stories behind them. And the answer to that is we at MAPE continually and always challenge ourselves to learn more about our products every day. I mean, we have a phenomenal R&D group uh, working in various locations in North America on our current product assortment and when we learn things and uh, we can make some updates uh, to the positioning, the performance, the attributes of these products and that's why we're spending some time together today, today together to learn about what some of those updates are and these are all the result of a lot of intensive R&D work, uh, some field evaluations and so on and so forth but a lot of things that I think are going you're going to find interesting, useful, and helpful when it comes to uh, the use of, the selling of uh, MAPE self-leveling underlayments. So having said that, let's just get started here and get into the, the nuts and bolts of what we're doing uh, in terms of self-leveling underlayments. And the first thing that you will notice if you go to our website and look at any of the technical data sheets for everything from NovaPlan 2 Plus all the way up to UltraPlan M20, uh, you'll notice that we've removed a lot of the moisture limits for our self-leveling underlayments, um, which is kind of the similar thing that we've done with our primer positioning, if you notice. So there are no real moisture limits. We used to say don't use on anything above five pounds moisture vapor emission rates or 80% RH levels. So those things are all gone. Uh, and what we have said is to uh, something here on the right side is, to, is a new set of wording. Basically what this has done and the reason why we're making these changes is that we've done an awful lot of work evaluating performance attributes of our uh, cement-based self-leveling underlayments under a wide range of humidity, relative humidity conditions, and we can safely say that they are um, not affected per se, by increased moisture levels. Now, I want to make um, something very clear here for the you and the audience to make sure that we're clear about one thing. We're talking about humidity conditions. We're not talking about liquid water. Under no conditions do we want any of our self-leveling underlayments to be used immersed in water. That's not what we're talking about. The differences here is humidity versus liquid water. We all live in an environment that has humidity in the environment. Um, Jen Kramer, who did our introduction here, is in the Florida area, and the relative humidity of that area outside is maybe 85, 90%. And you can walk through that uh, and not get your clothes wet. 
But the other side of the fence is if you're in the pool, that's water. So we're talking about uh, resistance, humidity, and moisture vapor rather than liquid uh, liquid water. So you will see some notices on our technical data sheets that say, do not use in the presence of standing water, do not use in areas with known hydrostatic pressure, osmotic blistering, anything that's going to generate liquid water is, is still a no-no for um, self-leveling island layments. But high RH, high humidity is not an issue. So what you'll see is the wording there that's on the right hand of the side of the screen that says basically do not use self-leveling other layments as a moisture vapor barrier. They're not going to block moisture. They're porous, which is a great thing for bonding adhesive materials to them. We want porosity, and that porosity still does allow the humidity that's in the concrete slab below it to pass through it. So uh, you know, depending upon what you're going to be installing on top of that leveler, if you're installing a floor covering that is moisture sensitive, you will still need to address the need for moisture vapor barriers installed, preferably below those levelers, some cases on top of those levelers. Um, but again, that's the driving factor. If the flooring material requires protection from subfloor humidity conditions, then you'll have to install a uh, moisture vapor barrier, but the leveler itself does not require that. So hopefully that's that's clear, and that is uh, something that's a, a change that we made to the to technical data sheets. Another thing that we've done, and again, this is all based on a lot of R&D work, uh, and as well as technical service work, Robinson rolling load test machines, and so on and so forth, where we've installed our levelers over properly installed wood underlayment systems, we're uh, able to safely remove the lath requirements over wood subfloors. In the past, you may remember that our technical data sheets had language in them about the installation of uh, expanded metal or mapalath type materials prior to the installation of self-leveling underlayments, but we've now determined that that's not necessary as long as the subfloor meets that L over 360 requirement the flex is out of it, um, they're stiff and stable, um, not necessarily requiring the use of a lath for that application. A lot of this comes from the fact that many of our self-leveling underlayments do contain amounts of fibrous reinforcement material. Um, you, I guess you could go so far as to say they're fiber reinforced, and that helps with flex and keep things from cracking. But again, as long as those wood underlayments are engineer approved, designed for what they're supposed to be done, um, and meet that L over 360 number uh, that's suitable for use directly over the top of them, as long as they're properly primed, uh, I must add. Uh, that's very important. I think at one point we were concerned about the liquid in the self-leveler penetrating into the plywood subfloor, causing things to swell, but keep in mind that self-leveling underlayments are not applied directly to plywood, they're not applied directly to concrete, in fact, they're applied directly to a primed surface. And that primer, uh, which we'll talk a little bit towards the end of this presentation, does a great job of protecting that moisture from the leveler mix from migrating out of it into the substrate. You don't want it to go that way. So uh, that would put the brakes on the flow property, cause all sorts of weirdness to happen in the self-leveling underlayment. So you want that primer to keep the moisture in the leveler and not let it go into the plywood. So the, the worry about plywood swell uh, is not really a concern at this point, as long as that subfloor is properly primed. Um, people are gonna ask me, I think one of the questions that may pop up, is that mean I can go over oriented strand board? Uh, as long as that is an engineered OSB material, then the answer to that is probably yes. But keep in mind that the basic grade chipboard that's used in a lot of multifamily housing projects is not really designed for that kind of application just because it's not sturdy enough. Uh, and the OSB Manufacturing Association, which there is one, recommends the only thing that goes on top of that chipboard type OSB is stretched in carpet. So we're still gonna keep to that recommendation um, going forward, if you have to level over that kind of substrate, then something else needs to be done as well. We'll 
talk to tech service about what that something else is. But anyway, that's another modification to the, the self-leveling underlayment technology, uh, technical data sheets. Another thing that's really important uh, to note in terms of updates for self-leveling underlayments is that we are reducing a lot of the requirements that we've been making on surface profile for many of our self-leveling underlayments. If you're familiar with the MAPE self-leveling underlayment line, you know that we have two levelers in there today that don't require surface prep, and those are uh, Nova Plan Easy Plus and Ultra Plan Easy Plus. These two products have been in our portfolio for a very long time uh, and were designed to be used on non-porous substrates, existing vinyl flooring, and some, so on and so forth without the need for mechanical profiling. Well, this is where I have to take a little step back and give you a little bit of a history lesson on our self-leveling underlayment portfolio. Those products were built way back when, and I apologize for my friend's background, uh, were built when the rest of our portfolio was pretty much made on Portland cement-based chemistry. Well, Portland cement-based chemistry is notorious for shrinking and uh, cracking if you don't give enough mechanical grab to get it to lock in. They have a very high tendency of movement uh, with the curing process. And I apologize for the dog in the background. Anyway, um, but as you will notice today, most of our self-leveling underlayments are already or have been converted to calcium aluminate cement based levelers. Any Anytime you see the word plus, behind the name like Nova Plan 2 Plus or Ultra Plan 1 Plus or Ultra Plan M20 Plus. That means that at some point in the history of that product, we have converted it from a Portland-based, Portland cement-based Portland cement chemistry to a calcium aluminate cement-based formulation. As a result of that, we now have a much more stable formula. Uh, the shrinkage and expansions of those formulations are a lot more controlled than the previous Portland cement-based chemistries. And so that's why we're able to relax, if you will, some of the requirements that we have for surface profile for many of these leveling compounds. So what you'll see now on a lot of our self-leveling underlayments is that we do want the concrete to be installed according to ASC F710 and free from all that hydrostatic pressure stuff. But the concrete needs to be clean properly primed and if you're not going if you're going to be using this for light um, traffic or light to moderate levels of traffic the surface profile requirements are not necessary to to create you don't need to shot blast or mechanically abrade to get that csp of two or three if you're installing any of our levelers now in these light to medium grade traffic conditions if you are moving into high performance applications, heavy rolling load stuff, warehouse floors, we're going to expose it to some very high traffic. It's a really good idea to provide that mechanical profile in there anyway. So we're leaving you some options based on how you plan on using the formulations. If you're using Ultra Plan 1 Plus at 3 16 of an inch thick, over a properly primed floor, surface profile is not necessary. If I'm using the same leveler at the maximum fill level of an inch and a half or maybe two, whatever that number is, then we need to consider doing some mechanical profiling to make sure you've got a good enough grab on the substrate to keep any kind of movement from occurring. Having said that, we do have some really good solutions for uh, a textured primer base that does do the same thing as mechanical profiling. And I would encourage a lot of you out there who are using self-leveling other layments in your day-to-day -day business or help uh, positioning, sell, or, or move our products into the marketplace, these textured primers really are the way to go for um, self-leveling other layment applications. It bypasses the mechanical abrasion, the shot blasting, and so on. Uh, and we have two of those that we have in the line, Primer X, 
which many of you are familiar with today is an as is an acrylic primer designed to work on non-porous substrates it's got a great um, uh, range of substrates that it's suitable for use for dries very quickly suitable for a, a slu application within an hour after application the other one we have had in our product portfolio for quite a long time is uh, eco prim grip that you probably know from our tsis side of the fence as a tile over tile primer uh, works extraordinarily well as well for self-leveling underlayment applications the thing to remember about eco prim grip is it does require uh, an extended amount of time for drying prior to application of self-leveling underlayments um, and again we'll talk a little bit about primers later on in the list but uh, it's this is really where you should be going um, for the use of our our leveling application of course our other primers that we have in the line are all still suitable for that um, but this is giving you a few more options on how you could approach um, preparation for self-leveling underlayments. Now, there are some exceptions to that rule, and we are going to put some requirements for shot blasting and mechanical abrasion for M20, Ultraplan M20, Ultraplan Light, and Ultraplan DPL. Uh, the reason why we are doing that is, if you understand the pro product portfolio, Ultraplan M20 is a high compression strength self-leveling underlayment and topping which quite often is used for heavy rolling load warehouse applications so in that particular case m20 still needs that mechanical grab that mechanical base to make sure that it works under that kind of environment ultra plan light and dpl are in this list because they are typically applied at very deep thicknesses uh, Ultraplan light can go up to two inches in a single pour application. Ultraplan DPL goes up to four inches in a single uh, pour application. So you're dealing with very thick layers of, of material that will do some contraction expansion during its curing process. And we really want to make sure we've got some control and anchoring, if you will, on the base of those to avoid debonding, uh, cracking, or delamination. So those three will still have some limitations on them. Other things we've added in terms of updates, the self-leveling underlayments, we've added some suitable substrates. Um, and again, MAPE's product portfolio continues to expand uh, with the addition of things like MAPE heat membranes and MAPE guard UM. Uh, if you're not familiar with these things, uh, please spend some time with your sales rep from MAPE or take a look at them on our website. Uh, the MAPA heat is a electric electric based radiant heat floor system uh, very exciting material uh, to help with uh, temperature control in in living environments and MAPA guard um is the uncoupling membrane for the ceramic tile side of the fence so uh, MAPA guard um is interesting in the fact that it is a moisture vapor barrier product by itself so if you're in the resilient floor world and you're looking for some other options for moisture control uh, MapaGuard UM can be installed to a concrete substrate of a wide variety of moisture, moisture levels using a thin set mortar and then come on top of it with a self-leveling underlayment and you've got a really nice system. The advantage here for all of these uh, membranes is that you don't need to prime them for prior to the application of self-leveling underlayment. That's really the only exception in the MAPA world for self-leveling underlayment that does not require primer. Again, these are all uniform materials, plastic-based, if you will, have some uh, means to control moisture transmission through them. That allows them to be used without uh, a primer on top. Not only to mention the fact that they've got texture to them, a mechanical grab already built into them. MapaGuard UM kind of looks like a waffle thing, and the MAPA heat membrane is is a fabric-y looking system. So all of these things have got a lot of mechanical grab. Other things we've done, the technical data sheets need to be updated because the, the green information that we were presenting, the green industry type stuff was lead based stuff. I think the last version was lead four that we had published on it. That all needs to be updated. Uh, so now what we have on there instead of green information, 
uh, is that we do meet certain requirements for the ASTM um, for compression strength data according to ASTM F710. Uh, we do have uh, compression statements that we meet that ASTM F28, sorry, I can't quite see the last number, 23, which is that uh, standard for self-leveling unalignment. So uh, that is proof that we meet some of those industry standards and we're applicable. We'll say that we are green building uh, Green Living Challenge, uh, red list free, which means uh, we don't have reportable levels of some uh, compounds that our people are concerned about in their, in their building. So that's very important as well. So changes. And I think the last addition that we're adding to our technical data sheets is the addition of some pullout strength data. A lot of times this has been asked of me uh, with regard to self-leveling performance particularly if you're applying uh, an epoxy coating, an epoxy wear layer on top of a self-leveling other limit, we need to know what the pullout strength is over any given substrate. And uh, you will start seeing in back in the, in the physical performance attributes chart, a data point that says pullout strength, and uh, you'll get that number. I think most epoxy floor covering materials require a minimum pullout strength of 250 PSI. Um, all of MAPI self-leveling other limits will meet or exceed that requirement uh, when tested even over primer T, which is kind of like the entry level primer going forward. So that's uh, also being added to the system. So in summary, and this is not the end of the presentation, so don't close your notebook up uh, and think that this is all over. This is just kind of the middle of the, of the story. These are the summaries that we've, um, of the updates that we've made to technical data sheets and positioning for our self-leveling underlayments. We've removed all the moisture limits for self-leveling underlayments. Again, use that carefully. It's the humidity levels and moisture vapor emission rate numbers are gone. That still says don't use these <laughs> to make a swimming pool. Uh, don't use them where there's a lot of liquid water present, hydrostatic pressure present. Um, we don't want these things immersed in water, but they will be porous and they will move that moisture vapor through them without uh, blocking it without impact. We remove the lath requirements over wood subfloors. Um, and again, I know a lot of uh, our commercial contractor friends have been doing leveler application over plywood decks without lath for a long time without any issue. This is just uh, an endorsement of that work. Reduction of surface profile requirements. Uh, again, it's giving you some options to, to look at that. These self-leveling underlayments in our portfolio, again, are all, for the most part, calcium aluminate cement-based materials, and as such are all kind of shrinkage compensated. So in a sense, they're pretty much all easy formulations. Uh, you, just asking you to use your discretion for where these things are going to be used. If it's high traffic, uh, if it's do going for full depth applications of self-leveling underlayments, you might want to consider putting some surface profile or using a textured primer. Um, again, we've added some new substrates, the Mapicar, Mapi Heat uh, membranes, the Mapicard UM. Uh, we've added some ASTM standards and green uh, certifications and the addition of pullout strength data. So. That in a nutshell is what we've done to the self-leveling underlayment portfolio. I would highly encourage all of you to, if you haven't done so, go back to the MAPE website and take a look at the technical data sheets, uh, update your knowledge and information on what uh, we've done there. So get familiar with them. Okay. Another thing I'm gonna add to our discussion here today is some changes that we're making in terms of silicate treated slabs. This has kind of been a hot topic for a long time. Um, and there are some of these compounds out there in the marketplace that we need to address. And I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about what those things do or don't do and how we're going to address them going forward. And there's two kinds of silicate things or silicate additives or silicate products that we need to talk about. One is going to be the integral silicate additive, something that's added to the ready mix truck and incorporated into the wet cement as it's placed 
in the forms to create the subform. Uh, and the second one is going to be topically applied uh, materials. First of all, let's go back to the first one, the integrally applied um, silicate materials. And these are being sold to the general contractor population as uh, a means to control moisture vapor transmission through a concrete slab. And they have some very interesting ways to explain that. Um, they also have some very interesting uh, statements to say that you can't test a moisture for a integrally treated concrete slab because of X, Y, and Z. Let's just step back a little bit and forgive me because I, I'm a chemist by nature. I really want to know why things work and what are they doing in a, a concrete slab. Uh, and I think it's important that you understand as well what these additives are really doing. And if you read their data sheets, and I encourage you to do that, look them up online and find out what they're doing. The main function that these products are designed to do is to create more calcium silicate hydrates in concrete. If you know anything about the concrete structure, those CSH, the calcium silicate hydrate, is the crystal formation, that, or the gel formation that helps create the strength of the concrete, helps close the pores, if you will, some of the porosity of, of a concrete slab. So, but that you also need to understand is already in concrete. If I don't add these additives, calcium silica hydrate is still being generated at certain levels because of the nature of the chemistry that goes on there. Concrete is made with calcium hydroxide and lime and a variety of other things. And these things and calcium sulfates and calcium silicates all this stuff is in there. This soup is mixing up with water and creates the calcium silicate hydrates anyway. So these additives are being added in them to create more of that calcium silicate hydrate. So they're really not changing the chemistry of a concrete slab. They're not changing the surface profile of a concrete slab. Um, they're just adding more of that glue, if you will, that theoretically is going to reduce some of the uh, the porosity of a concrete slab. It has been our experience that those chemical additives don't really reduce the porosity or the moisture vapor emission rates of a concrete slab to that level that you might want to think. It's not like putting an epoxy moisture vapor barrier on top of concrete slab and actually closing the window completely to moisture vapor transmission. Um, they may slow it down a little bit, but it's still, uh, to a certain extent, porous. Water can still get down into those concrete slabs. There's still some porosity. It depends on how the product's finished and so on. But at the end of the day, it's still concrete, maybe concrete on steroids, if you will, with a little bit more of the CHS stuff that's in it. All right. At the end of the day, What's important for you to understand, at least from my perspective, is that MEPE and many of us in the uh, adhesive manufacturing world, particularly for the resilient floor market these days and the LVT installation methods, we really don't care what the moisture vapor emission rates of a concrete slab are to begin with. So, uh, and we have adhesive systems that can be used on concrete with RH levels of 99%, moisture vapor emission rates of up to 15 pounds. I mean, it's at the end of the day, we don't have much in the way of, of uh, requirements for moisture control. It's, uh, that's, a, that's a whole nother webinar discussion to begin with of why that works and how that happens. But at the end of the day, we have installation methods, whether they are water-based pressure sensitive materials, reactive adhesive systems, two part or one part that really don't care what the moisture vapor emission rate is of a concrete slab. So if you do have the opportunity to talk to a general contractor or work with a general contractor who's contemplating adding this extra money into a concrete slab for some perceived benefit, remind them that's really not necessary with today's installation materials. So um, basically what I'm trying to tell you here is that Going forward, if you are dealing with a concrete slab that has been treated with an integral treated compound to uh, 
control moisture vapor emission reads. We're going to look at that as if it were a normal concrete slab. And I would still recommend doing moisture testing anyway, just to have that information on record. Um, a look at porosity if it's necessary for the function of the adhesive. But again, keep in mind that many of our adhesives are designed to work on non-porous substrates. Uh, they need to be clean, free from dirt and debris, bond breakers have to be removed, etc. But at the end of the day, we're looking at them as if they were normal concrete slabs. So that's a little bit of a different position uh, than what we have taken in the past. Uh, again, if you were dealing with a flooring product, let's say wood, for example, uh, an engineer wood or solid wood or some other flooring material that might have moisture sensitivity issues, then you need to start looking at moisture vapor barrier products installed uh, to protect that floor from the moisture vapor transmission. But if you're not, if it's a resilient floor that's moisture resistant, not sensitive to moisture, then you can go directly with our installation materials for that. All right, so that's a big change, if you will. Uh, and I would ask you to inc incorporate that into your thought processes as you're dealing with these in the marketplace today. Um, just install over them. It's really quite that simple as far as I'm concerned. Topically treated materials, on the other hand, are a different story as far as I'm concerned. Again, you have to understand what these compounds are and what you're doing to the surface of the concrete at this point. A lot of them are, uh, what do we call a, it's a, sil a water dispersed silicate solution. In many cases are like densifiers. It's a sodium silicate, a lithium silicate, uh, a potassium silicate type material that is in delivered to the job site in water. And you spray this stuff on with a garden sprayer or some other kind of mechanical device to penetrate into the concrete. Again, they do the same kind of thing that the integral uh, treatments do by generating additional calcium silicate hydrates and hopefully block the pores up. But in this case, you're putting a high concentration of a water dispersible material on the surface. And I'm particularly concerned, and you should be particularly concerned about what kind of chemical soup they are leaving on that surface of the concrete. Uh, and look a little bit about uh, the consistency of how those things are applied. I know when I'm out spraying Roundup on my weeds and I'm out, out in the yard or whatever that I've got to deal with, consistency of application is not controlled. Um, if you stand around a little bit, you could get a higher concentration in one spot, not enough in another. But at the end of the day, you're still applying a salt solution on top of a concrete slab. And if you listen to any of my other webinars uh, talking about what causes uh, these high moisture adhesive systems to fail, a lot of it has to do with these salt contaminants on the surface of a concrete slab, creating an osmotic engine, if you will, that sucks water out of the concrete slab and creates a high pH liquid environment underneath the material that nothing can survive. So I'm concerned uh, greatly about these topically applied materials, the contaminations that they leave, the high salt concentrations they leave, and the potential, propent <laughs> I guess, uh, the potential for even creating more of a moisture problem than they were trying to solve. So, if you're on a job site that has a topically applied silicate treatment for moisture control, we are going to request that that be removed, abraded off. The top eighth of an inch, three millimeters of concrete needs to be removed prior to going forward on any kind of installation method. They're just dangerous. I'm sorry, I, there's no other way to say that. Um, and I would avoid them at all costs. They just create more problems than they're worth. So there's, uh, this is kind of the updates on where we're looking at for slabs going forward. If it's an integral treated concrete slab, green lights, if you will, just treat it like a normal slab. I would still do moisture tests as you normally do, just to have that on record. pH tests are important to make sure you're dealing with appropriately cured concrete, um, but to topically treated slabs still need some abrasion going forward, okay? Big news, all right, now I can't 
talk about self-leveling underlayments without spending just a little bit of time about our primers because they really need to talk about them at the same time. You can't talk about self-levelers without talking about primers at the same time because they have to be used together. And again, we've talked about this before in previous presentations and webinars, but there are it's a very important and necessary function for self-leveling underlayments to perform. Our SLUs for the MAPE product portfolio in general do not bond directly to a substrate like plywood or concrete or gypsum stuff or existing resilient flooring. They bond to a primer. Um, and that primer is extremely important for a variety of reasons. It creates that uniform substrate for the leveler to work on. Um, you know, if you're going on any other open flooring material, concrete chemistry is going to change from one square foot to the next square foot. The porosity is going to change. The uh, the texture is going to change. So a unif a primer helps eliminate all the variables on that floor, uh, and it helps provide something for the leveler to bond to. And it also creates, uh, it seals that substrate. We talked about this earlier today over plywood substrates. This primer helps prevent moisture from the self leveler to go out of it into the substrate, which would essentially put the brakes on any kind of flow properties. It also helps prevent any air bubbles that might be in the substrate, whether it's plywood or concrete from penetrating through creating pinholes and bubbles and fish eyes in the surface of the, of the self-leveling underlayment. That's the last thing you want to have happen with any kind of self-leveling underlayment application is you don't want to spend all this time to get a nice smooth floor and then all of a sudden come back the next afternoon and it's got all these bubbles popped up at which was air bubbles from the substrate causing these pinholes. That means you got to come back in with a skim coat and a patch and blah, blah, blah. Not something we want to deal with. We also have primers that help consolidate weakened substrates. Sometimes uh, it's a gypsum underlayment that needs some consolidation. Sometimes it's a, a lightweight concrete that needs some strengthening prior to the application of a self-leveling underlayment. You do not want to go on friable, falling apart substrates. The goal of a self-leveling application is it's got to marry very well to the substrate and create a very strong surface. Uh, and last thing is that in some cases, in, in really in a lot of them, it creates the texture for the enhanced mechanical bond. This is extremely obvious with our um, products like Primer X and Eco Prim Grip that have aggregate in them. When you open them up and apply them, you can run your hand across it. It's like 30 grit sandpaper. It's very aggressive stuff. But even our other primers like Primer T, for example, as you're applying them with a roller on the floor, create some sort of a, a texture, like a, it's a texture on the floor because, and as it dries, that helps uh, with the mechanical bonding as well. So those are the main functions that a primer has. In the MAPE product portfolio, we have a lot of different choices for chemistries for that. We have acrylic primers that work on both porous and non-porous stuff. Um, we have water-based textured materials that work on a wide variety of systems. We have epoxy based primers from when, when you're, if you're going to be doing high performance applications uh, where you really need to make sure that everything is locked up, that's when epoxies come in. And not everybody has that in their portfolio. MAPE has quite a few choices in that area for you to, to pick from for uh, improving their performance of the overall installation. And we have some polyurethane systems as well. Not only do they provide a primer base, but they also can control subfloor moisture vapor transmissions as well. And just to running through the numbers for you as well, uh, our acrylic primers that we have available to you, our primer L, uh, which is our, I hate to say this, but our entry level acrylic primer that's dilutable and used a lot to prepare gypsum underlayments uh, for subsequent floor covering installation. A very useful material, but its limitations are that it has to be used on porous substrates only. It's not something that you're gonna want to build a film on. It needs to penetrate in. So it's porous concrete, 
porous gypsum and so on. Primer T is the evolution of primer L with a more robust formulation that can be used on both non-porous and porous materials. It can be diluted, to, I think one to one or two to one for certain applications uh, as need be, but generally speaking, primer T is used as in, in its full strength level. And one product that we have in that's uh, kind of unique in that it is a moisture vapor barrier reducer product as well as a primer is Planaseal MSP. This is a two coat application that gives you up to 15 pounds and 99% moisture vapor barrier reduction and also acts as a primer for self-leveling underlayments as well. So if you're working on ways to do things faster, simpler, with less components and less uh, hazardous materials on the job site, do consider Planaseal MSP as, a, as another solution for priming, okay? Texture primers, um, in the water-based domain, we have Primer X. Uh, this one was specifically designed to work on top of epoxy moisture vapor barrier systems like Planaseal VS, VS Fast, and others, but also works quite well on other non-porous substrates, um, including porous subfloors like um, wood and concrete as well. Very fast drying. This is one of its claims to fame that it can dry and after application within an hour. Uh, and we all know that in the contracting world, speed is king. It's, it's got to be done. So Primer X is very fast. Eco Prim Grip is also a very aggressive primer. Uh, works very well over porous and non-porous substrates as well as existing ceramic tile. Uh, it has some limitations on dry time and I will don't quote me on this one, but I think it's in that four to five hour time frame prior to the application of anything on top of it. Again, dry time, I'm going to sidebar here. When I'm talking about water-based primers, that dry time is extraordinarily important to pay attention to. The primer has to be dry before you put the self-leveling on the layman on top of it. If it is not, nine times out of 10, you're going to have a deep bottoming problem. Um, just because you can touch the top surface of the primer and that doesn't transfer your finger is not necessarily mean it's dry. These things have to be clear. They have to make sure that they're properly dry. There's no more transfer of the touch. You can't squish it, move it. There's no wet anywhere left in it. Because these levelers in, in big applications do move a little bit during the curing process, if that primer is still wet, it's like trying to get paint to stick to itself you're going to wind up with some delamination problems. So do make sure you pay attention to the dry time on a water-based primer. On the reactive side, uh, we have a whole bunch of choices for that. Primer E is a two-part low viscosity epoxy primer, works on all kinds of substrates, but needs to have a sand thrown into the top surface to provide that mechanical bond. It goes on metals, it goes on aluminum, it goes on existing ceramic tile, existing anything. Um, it is that robust solution for priming virtually anything, again, for high performance applications. The sands that you would need to use, uh, we offer as well Mapasan Coarse and Mapasan Fine. Um, either one of those can be used as a sand broadcast on top of it, typically one pound of these sand materials per square foot. What's not incorporated in the epoxy is, is swept off and vacuumed off and used for the next project, but it does need the sand broadcast. Primer CE, this is a consolidating epoxy. Again, another low, ultra low viscosity material. If you're dealing with a substrate that is brittle, friable, needs some consolidation, Primer CE is a very, uh, penetrates deeply into those systems and creates a, a stronger material on which to bond with. It would require another epoxy coating on top of it with a sand broadcast in order to prime for self-leveling underlayments. Primer WE is a water-based epoxy. Um, it's not a sand broadcast type material, but it is a, a two-part water-based system, mix the two components together. As it cures, it creates a very sticky, very robust, um, a primer solution for self-leveling underlayments. It is a uh, a problem solver, and we've used it a lot of times in instances where everything else kind of gives us a head scratch. 
Kramer SN is not an FCIS product, but I threw this in the box as well because it is a great primer for high performance toppings. Um, it is a fillerized epoxy material that comes pre-gridded, if you will. It allows you some options to add more sand to it while you're mixing it or broadcast sand on top of it after it's applied while it's still wet. But it is uh, kind of the future for uh, applications where you're doing topping applications. So if you're doing M20 in a warehouse floor or M20, you're gonna do some polishing, a dry polishing M20 to give it a nice gloss, uh, you would use Primer SN in one form or another there, okay? The last one is poly uh, is a polyurethane primer and a line planet seal PMB. Uh, you may know this in our wood domain where we use an awful lot uh, in a single coat application underneath urethanes or MS adhesives for enhanced moisture vapor transmission reduction. Uh, but you can use this in a dual coat application on porous concrete with a sand broadcast as a moisture vapor barrier bonding solution for self-leveling underlayments. So something to keep in mind. If you're not familiar with that, do spend some time taking a look at that as well. So I've loaded you up with a lot of stuff. Uh, it's about 45 minutes into it, and I'm going to hand it back over to Jen to see if we have any questions. Again, thank you for your time on that. Jen, back to you. Thanks, Jeff. And boy, my hand is cramped from taking notes. <laughs> and we do have quite a few questions, so that's good. Um, Let's see, the first one, poor depth requirement over MAPA heat and MAPA guard UM. Um, so that's the first part of this one. What's the poor depth requirement? And uh, minimum thickness over the top of the lugs. So there you go, double barrel question. <laughs> I believe, and I will have to take a note to get back to you on this, but I think it's a minimum of one quarter of an inch over the top of the lugs. It's it's the thinnest you can go. Uh, I think the test methods we've done, and I think that's the number. So it has to be a quarter of an inch or greater over that, but there's no maximum coverage on top of it. So you, if you need an inch and a half, you get an inch and a half. But it's got to be a, a quarter of an inch. And I'll double check that if you'll take a note, Jen. Yeah, the, the, his email and everything is in the in the yeah. chat. So got that, it. It is available. On our website and the tech bulletin, there's leveler applications over MAPA heat membranes and UM um, that is readily available. I'll find that as well. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So we'll get back on that one. Okay. This is going to, what is the requirement for leveling with 24 inch on center joists? Well, again, that's going to have to go back to the to tech. Yeah. Tech service will help you on that. The L over 360, there's an L over 720 um, data as well for wood underlayments, and that gets to be a little bit more extensive. But I believe they can help you with that as well. The TCNA, I think, has some requirements uh, that can be helpful in this domain as well. But it's as long as the flex reading is uh, good, uh, that's way to go. By the way, I just got a blurb that came up that said three eighths inches, the minimum thickness over those membranes, UM and uh, MAPA heat. Oh, minimum good. thickness, three eighths. Nice. Tech Next service question. is listening in. <laughs> nah, just UM. I'm sorry, I'm getting more flicks. It's just UM. The MAPA heat should be about the same thing, but go ahead. Ah. I'll, I'll verify and confirm. <laughs> All right. Next question. Of, yeah. Yeah, it's nice. Um, okay, so what is the best recommended primer for concrete that has been scraped clean of adhesive and just staining is left? And that's you've given so many primers. <laughs> well, I think the best choice on that case is Primer T for that application. It goes over non-porous substrates. Uh, obviously, you want to get all that adhesive residue off as much as possible, but I think that's the the best solution for that application. Good choice, okay. Um, let's see, bear with me while I read this small on my screen, sorry. 
and um, I get up I, while you consider the screen I'll answer some more of that I would okay, good. I recommend you look at the <laughs> technical data sheets that are around I think equal prim grip can go over old adhesive residue as well um, I don't believe primer x has got that limit availability to it it was kind of designed for a more clean high performance application but T and eco prim grip are both uh, good solutions for old adhesive residues um, okay Good, thank you. All right, does MSP require a porous slab? Absolutely, and that is one of the main key performance attributes of MSP or even PMB. Both of those need some porosity in order to work. Um, they need the mechanical grab. They, they do create a film on top of the surface. MSP specifically is a film former, uh, but needs that mechanical grab in order to function. If you've got non-porous stuff, it will it peels off. PMB must have porosity because you're actually not trying to build a film for that. You're trying to fill the pores with a urethane material, double coat application or not. Um, but both of those do require porosity. Do not install them over non-porous substrates. Okay, right. What is the position now on the integral silicates when they do create a porosity issue in relation to installing patching or skim coating products directly onto them? Again, uh, many of our patching compounds, particularly PSC, mm -hmm. can be used over non-porous substrates. We use that as an embossing level of existing vinyl. So I'm not in concern there. Uh, PSC would certainly be able to do that as well. If you're doing a planet patch, I would add the additive. I would I would address it as if it was a non-porous substrate and follow the instructions on the respective TDS for those materials and how to deal with it. Good deal. All right, let's see. Okay, well, has anything changed in terms of technique? if I have to do multiple lifts of a self-leveling underlayment? No, that's uh, not necessary. I mean, that's not changed. Um, you still need to follow the instructions for the amount of time required for secondary lift application. I think we've added that to the technical data sheets as well. Most of the time, that is the same amount of time you'd have to wait to prior to installing resilient floor covering. You need to let that leveler dry out as much the first layer of leveler to dry out as much as possible that really hasn't changed uh, it still needs to be primed that hasn't changed so there is no real changes if you will to the secondary levels of application for prime uh, for app, excuse me for self-leveling underlayments <laughs> having said that uh, tongue twister sorry um, yeah. I, you are doing multiple lifts of any given self-leveling underlayment, I would encourage you to take a look at some of the other levelers that we have that can be installed at thicker application rates without having to do the multiple lifts. Uh, NovaPlan DPL is a great choice for that, where you, you know, if you need a, a certain performance level hardness on it, you can do DPL up to 80% of the total thickness you require, and then a secondary layer of a fast set version on top to create hard surfaces but keep in mind that dpl is a good starting point for uh, thick poor applications we also have some great information available on our technical data sheet uh, excuse me on our website in our technical bulletin section about extension of self leveling underlayments as well as the use of high density foam board to extend leveler use you know self leveling underlayments it admittedly are expensive if you're trying to go three inches of fill you're lucky if you're going to get a half a bag per square foot um, that adds up coins pretty quickly if you're trying to do that kind of application um, take a look at our tech bulletin on extension of levelers and the use of high density foam boards um, that might help save you some money save some labor costs and are a solution for you on how to do deep pores at, at, at a different a different way of than multiple lifts of the same thing over and over and over again okay 
Exactly. Thank you. Well, we are coming up toward the end, and I know um, I certainly need time to go back over my notes on <laughs> things like this, and questions always come up after the fact. So um, if there are people like me <laughs> who always think of questions after the fact, um, after we say goodbye, you can always send them to mapeydigital at mapay.com and I'll be sure that Jeff gets them and will answer them for you. Um, and as Jeff said, there's a ton of information online on our website uh, on the floor, uh, floor covering and installation systems page or uh, our technical data page. And uh, you can find that at www.mapay.com. Um, and there's just flooring solutions, technical data, self-leveler information galore. So please, we invite you to go check that out. Uh, and with that, I'm going to conclude today's webinar. Thank you, Jeff, uh, as usual, for another really informative uh, webinar. And I'll look forward to the next one. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. We know that uh, your days are very busy. So the fact that you took time out to spend some time with us is very important, and we appreciate it. Um, with that, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.